Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, I have wanted to do this episode for a long time. I know. (laughs) I think I've mentioned it to you like four times over the last several years at least. Um, So if you visit any zoo or facility that has a copy in their collection, you will often hear or see the information that this animal was discovered by the Western world in the early 20th century. And we have to very hard air quote that discovery because, of course, indigenous populations have known about them for a long time. We will talk about how important this animal is to the area where it it naturally lives. Um, And every time I hear that, I kind of want to stand up and tell everyone there, like all of the other tourists, that there were certainly people who lived in Africa who knew about the Okapi, but I also don't want to be that disruptive. They probably wouldn't welcome that on the little safari ride. Um, And most of the time, there will have actually been some mention or phrase that indicates that, no, no, that was just to the Western world. But I also know that in scenarios like that, people miss nuance, and I worry. Uh, So today we will talk about how a series of efforts on the parts of various European explorers brought this animal to the attention of the European naturalist community. Again, not a discovery. Um, this is one where I, you know, often will do ones where it's like, oh, a cute animal. Oh, no, horrible things. Um, I knew the horrible things were there, so there were no surprises in that regard. But we should, of course, let people know that... Um, Sometimes in the quest to collect animal specimens, particularly when you don't know anything about that animal, people are ding-dongs. And so there is some sad animal stuff in this one. Um, Yeah. So just know that going in. It was also happening concurrently with some horrific things imposed onto the people of the region by Europeans that's totally outside the scope of this episode. Yes. I mean, we kind of hint at it to give the shape of what was going on. Right. But right. Uh, we don't we don't get deep into all of the politicking that was going on. And the we mentioned the land grabbing, but we're not going super deep into all of that. You see the rails of it as we're we're telling the story. Okapia Johnstoney, we'll talk about that name in a bit, is a mammal. It has a primarily russet red body with striped flanks. And because of those distinctive stripes, people often assume, uh, particularly lay people, that this must be related to the zebra. It's actually in the same family as the giraffe. It's roughly the same size as a horse, standing about five feet at the shoulder and six feet at the head. So it's a little under two meters. The main natural habitat for the okapi is the Ituri Forest, which is a tropical rainforest in what is the Democratic Republic of Congo today. And this forest area is in a northeastern section of the Congo River Basin in the equatorial region, kind of right in the middle of Africa. The climate in this area is is actually pretty consistent throughout the year with two rainy seasons, and the temperature is likely much milder than you may expect. The average temperature is 75.9 degrees Fahrenheit with highs and lows of 70 degrees and 90 degrees. If you do your temperature in Celsius, that's an average of 24.4 degrees, a low of 21.1, and a high of 32.2. That sounds pretty lovely to me. Um... The Aturi Forest is home to all kinds of animals, of course, in addition to the okapi, including birds, monkeys, chimpanzees, bush babies, bongos, pangolins, elephants, all kinds of insects, uh, a mix of diurnal and nocturnal species. It is the most biodiverse area of Africa. The okapi are believed to have existed for six or seven million years This animal is also the symbol of the Congo, and images of a copy appear on the country's banknotes, even on their military uniforms. In a 2020 talk, John Lucas, founder and president of the Okapi Conservation Project, said, quote, you don't have to go up to anybody in Congo and explain what an Okapi is. No, everywhere else, but not there. Uh, which is an indicator, too, of how long it has just been part of the culture there. But to tell the story of how the Western world learned of the Okapi, we have to start with a pretty familiar name, and that is Dr. David Livingstone. There is an entire episode in the archives about him from previous host Sarah and Dublina, so we won't rehash his entire story. 
The important thing here is that he went to Africa, and because he got himself lost, uh, he becomes the first, although very minor, link in the chain of how the Western world learned about this animal. As you'll recall, if you've listened to that episode, or if you're just familiar with the story, Sir Henry Morton Stanley was dispatched to Africa to look for the missing missionary, and he was successful in finding Livingstone. And as a reward for that success, he was commissioned by Belgium's King Leopold II, one of the most notorious names associated with this region in this era, Mm -hmm. uh, was sent to return to Africa in 1871, he had a directive of exploring the Congo, and while he was there, he and his men spotted some glimpses but never got a really good look at a unique creature. Yeah, at this point, Belgium had a very strong hold on this area, and so you'll hear Belgium and the Belgian military mentioned throughout this episode. So a decade even before Sir Henry Morton Stanley thought he had seen this interesting creature, Philip Goss had published The Romance of Natural History, in which the author put forth the idea that Central Africa was the place where the world's undiscovered species were likely most concentrated. For European naturalists and explorers, this had given this area an incredible appeal and, as the book title suggested, a degree of romance. It is not really a long walk to suspect that many of them imagined the glory of traveling to the African continent and discovering, again, air quotes, new species. And to dovetail on our recent episode on unicorns, that was one of the animals that Goss had speculated could be found in Central Africa. It doesn't seem like Stanley thought he had seen a unicorn, but he was curious about the animal he could never quite see. Stanley would later write of it in 1890 when he published a book about his travels titled In Darkest Africa. In this book, he incorrectly identifies the indigenous Mbuti people as Wambuti, but it's from them that he learned that they were familiar with these this difficult-to-spot mammal, writing that they, quote, knew a donkey and called it Ati. Stanley writes that the Mbuti would trap these animals, which were herbivores, in pits on occasion. He also told colleagues that the near sightings that he had of the Ati were in the area to the west of the Simliki River. The next person to enter this story is Wilhelm Juncker. And Juncker was born in Moscow on April 6th, 1840, into a German family. His education took him through various cities, Göttingen, St. Petersburg, Berlin, and Prague. And then in 1874, he traveled to Tunis and followed that trip up with a trip to Egypt, during which he made a study of the areas surrounding the Nile River and its tributaries. According to an obituary for Juncker that appeared in the Journal of the American Geographical Society of New York, quote, it was Dr. Juncker's method to make his way into the region he wanted to explore and take up residence among the people for a length of time, learning their language, and studying under these exceptional conditions the ethnology and the natural history of the district. From 1882 to 1886, Juncker was in the Congo, and the indigenous people of the region gave him a piece of animal skin. It was striped, and the tribe who gave him this skin called the animal that it came from, Makapi. Juncker surprisingly didn't think this was a particularly interesting find. He just thought he had a piece of a hide from a musk deer. Incidentally, Juncker's trip that he got that hide on lasted much longer than intended. He had not planned to stay there for four years, but the Islamic population of Sudan revolted against the Egyptian-led government while he was there, and in the fighting and counterattacks that followed, Juncker got kind of trapped. He was unable to return to Europe by just traveling north through the Sudan as he normally would, and instead, he ended up traveling southeast through modern-day Tanzania and made his way to Africa's eastern coast on the Indian Ocean. That obituary that we just quoted from states that, quote, in 1886, the Russian traveler suddenly appeared at Zanzibar, like a man returned from the dead. He only lived six years after he returned home from this trip, so he wasn't around quite long enough to have learned that he had a hide from an okapi. In 1889, French Army Captain Jean-Baptiste Marchand was in Central Africa and kept a journal of his travels there. 
He described an animal that he spotted near the river, and it was, by his account, beautiful and timid. It didn't quite look like any other he had seen or could find in existing literature. He thought it was an antelope. So the next person that we need to introduce, and really, uh, to most people, probably the most pivotal in the Okapi story from the Westerner perspective, is Sir Harry Hamilton Johnston. He's actually a little bit difficult to discuss because so much writing about him is pretty ebullient, although he was a significant player in the expansion of Britain's land holdings in the scramble for Africa, which of course in many, and I would say most cases, had devastating and irreversible effects for indigenous peoples and cultures. We're going to talk about that and both his good and bad impacts when we come back from a quick sponsor break. Johnston was born in London on June 12, 1858, and attended Stockwell Grammar School as a child. Later in his education, he studied language at King's College, and then he went to the Royal Academy to study painting. The obituary for him that ran in the periodical Nature in 1927 reads, quote, Endowed with great natural ability and with a vigorous and fearless mind, he soon displayed an amazing versatility which led him to success along many different paths. Kind of what I mean when I say that all of his writing about him is pretty crazy. When you see Johnston's list of careers, it usually includes naturalist, artist, linguist, anthropologist, colonial administrator, and writer. He wrote dozens of books during his lifetime, many of which were about Africa. Johnston's first visit to Africa was to Tunis in 1879. That means he was in his early 20s when that happened. At this point, he was gathering specimens, painting what he saw, and writing as a journalist. And because he captured images with his sketch pad for explorers, and because he was able to communicate with a lot of people with his language skills, he was soon seen as an experienced explorer in his own right. And he was receiving assignments to go on a variety of expeditions. Additionally, of course, that set of skills, particularly his ability to... uh, pick up languages that he encountered meant that he was the perfect emissary for the British Empire in the scramble for Africa. And as a colonial administrator, he negotiated a number of agreements that established Britain's footprint there. One obituary credited him with accumulating 400,000 square miles of territory for the crown. We mentioned a moment ago that Jean-Baptiste Marchand had spotted an animal that was probably what we came to know as an Okapi. Also in 1899, Johnston was made the governor of the British Protectorate of Uganda, which had been established in 1894 after Britain got involved in an ongoing battle for control among four religious groups. Three of those religions were exogenous. Islam had arrived in the region in the 18th century through trade. Catholicism and Protestantism spread in the area through missionary expeditions in the 19th century, and then the other was Uganda's native religion. So when Johnston was appointed to his new post, he reached out to colleagues with knowledge of the region, including Sir Henry Morton Stanley. And when the two men spoke about Stanley's experiences there, that so-called atti was a significant part of the conversation. Johnston wanted to learn as much as he could about this elusive animal and possible new species. Not long after Johnston assumed this new role, a group of Mbuti were kidnapped by a German or a group of Germans who intended to take them to France and exhibit them at the Paris Exposition. The details of this entire situation are always a little vague, but the kidnappers and their victims fled to Uganda, There, they were intercepted by Belgian forces who reached out to Johnston to escort the captured men back to the Aturi forest where they lived. This is bringing a story to mind of another man who was exhibited at a World's Fair and whose life ended tragically in suicide. That was Odabanga, who was kidnapped and sold to businessman Samuel Phillips Werner in 1904. Although Otabenga was also Mbuti, his kidnapping took place several years after the events we're talking about here. While Johnston was with the Mbuti, he took the opportunity to ask them about that animal called the Ati that Henry Morton Stanley had told him about. From the Mbuti men, he learned that they didn't call it Ati, but Wapi. 
it's like a copy, but there's a, a, an apostrophe where the K would go. Given how far off Stanley was on the name of the tribe, this mistake about the name is not really very surprising. The Mabuti described it as an animal similar to a donkey, but with stripes. And this led Johnston, like many people today, to assume that it might be a species of forest-inhabiting zebra. Johnston had stopped en route to his mission to return the men home to the fort held by Belgian forces, which was called Fort Benny. And he asked the commander of the fort if he had seen this animal that looked like a striped donkey. It turned out that he had. They had a skin of one of them at the fort, but it had been cut up to make bandoliers and belts so Johnston couldn't see the hide in its entirety. He was given two bandoliers to keep, though, and he also learned yet another name for this animal that was used by indigenous people to the area. That was Okapi. Johnston decided that they should have a little side quest and mount an expedition immediately to try to find this mysterious animal. According to accounts written by white witnesses, the Mabuti served as his guides, and they were able to point out the places Okapi had been in the forest, although no sighting happened on this trip. Johnston was surprised to see that the tracks that he had been shown by the Mabuti were made by a cloven hoof animal, not one with a single hoof like you would see on a horse or a zebra. And that made Johnston worry that this whole thing may have been some sort of deception on the part of his guides, because all of the other information that he had seen or read indicated that this was some kind of zebra-like animal. The expedition was cut short when a malaria outbreak started in the travel party. They made their way back to Uganda thanks to a Belgian military escort, and Johnston was openly disappointed in having not seen an Okapi, He sent the bandoliers made with the animal's skin to London so an expert could analyze them. And that expert was Dr. Philip Lutley Sclater, who was secretary of the Zoological Society of London. Sclater's path to zoology had been kind of a zigzagging one. He was born in 1829, and his academic focus at Corpus Christi College, Oxford, had been mathematics, in which he excelled, apparently. But then, as a career, it seemed he was destined for a life in law. He became a barrister and member of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn in 1855. And when Philip was in his mid-40s, his brother George Sclater Booth became president of the local government board, and Philip became his private secretary. Through all of that, though, Philip had been interested in zoology and had studied it as sort of a serious hobby. He became the Zoological Society's secretary in 1859, 41 years before he received the parcel containing those Okapi skin bandoliers. So he had been in that post a long time, and yet he was as confused as anybody else about these skins. When he examined them, he found that the hair on the hide was similar to that of a zebra or a giraffe, but he thought it was too dissimilar from an antelope for it to be a relative. Slater shared the samples with other members of the Zoological Society in a meeting in mid-December 1900, and soon London was just abuzz with the possibility that a new mammal had been discovered. And though papers picked up the story, there was still not a whole lot to go on. Nobody knew what this was, so the write-ups were largely quite speculative and walked through the possibilities of it being some sort of new species of zebra or, despite evidence to the contrary, some kind of antelope. Mostly, the journalism coverage of this alleged find just emphasized how eager people were to actually see whatever it was. Even though there was no specimen on hand, the hide samples from the bandoliers were enough for the Zoological Society to declare that Johnston had indeed found a new species. And on February 1st, 1901, they named it Equus Johnstoni. That Equus meant that they believed it to be a member of the genus Equidae. That's the same one shared by horses and zebras. Johnston was still in Uganda when this happened, and he had not seen one of the animals either. I like this idea that he discovered a new species without ever having seen what it was. Um, When Johnston had to cut his active search short due to that malaria outbreak, a Belgian officer named Mira had promised Johnston that his men would capture one of these animals and send him an intact hide to study. But then that officer, Mira, died from a complication from malaria himself, not long after that promise was made. 
However, another officer from Fort Mabenny made good on the promise. By April 1901, Johnston had a skin and two skulls, as well as a very detailed written description of the animal. And it was the skulls that made Johnston realize that the animal he'd been pursuing was not a close relative of the horse or the zebra, as it had been presumed up to that point. It was at this point that the connection was made to the giraffe family. So Johnston sent the new hide and skulls along to the Zoological Society. He also provided a watercolor of the animal for additional visual reference. That watercolor was still speculative, though, because Johnston still hadn't seen a living copy. He also included a letter with all the information he'd gathered and his conclusions about the animal's likely genus. We're going to talk about how things unfolded after Johnston's new specimens got to London after we hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. All of the materials that Johnston had sent to London were shared at a meeting of the Zoological Society on May 7, 1901. And while this was a pretty exciting moment for the Society, a month later, their meeting was even more thrilling because Harry Johnston had returned from Africa and he was in attendance to lecture on the find himself. And during this lecture, he proposed that this new species uh, be given the scientific name Helidotherium tigrunum. Helidotherium is an extinct genus related to giraffidae, and tigrunum means striped, like a tiger. An article ran in the Times titled, A New Mammal, and it opened with the line, quote, The Helidotherian is alive in the Congo Free State. An article about Johnston's, quote, discovery ran in multiple papers throughout the U.S. under the headline, Newly Discovered Beast of the Congo Forests. And it talked about the, quote, absolutely new type of existing animal that was alleged to be, quote, a living representative of a lost form. All of this press around Johnston's new animal set off a frenzy. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to be the first to capture a live okapi. And within just a few years, expeditions sent from various European and U.S. museums had grown so numerous that the Belgian government put a licensing and permit system in place to try to control the number of people just prowling the Aturi forest looking for a copy. The following year, more samples arrived in Europe from the Aturi forest, this time sent to Brussels by a Belgian officer. The parcel included two skins and a complete skeleton. A zoologist named Charles Emmanuel Forsyth Major traveled to Brussels to examine the skeleton and the hides and determined that the Belgian officer had actually found a different species of animal from the one that Johnston's samples had been from. He was incorrect but did not know that and named this new species Ocapia labrecti. Yet another alleged different Ocapi species was discovered in 1903. Again, discovered is not really accurate, (laughs) when yet another skin landed in London. This one was named in honor of the man who had first obtained the full skin and skull samples for Johnston, whose name was Erickson. So this species, again, incorrectly identified as different from the other two, was called Ocapia Ericksoni. But as all of these samples continued to be examined and analyzed, naturalists realized they were not actually different enough to be different species. Part of the issue had stemmed from the skins not having any evidence of the animal's sexes intact. Different people had prepared each skin, and though this work was all done by indigenous peoples, they didn't all prepare skins in the exact same way. So a lot of the variances that had been noted as evidence of a different species were really just that uh, they were the results of sex or age difference, so... It's got back to just the one species. I love how there was this explosion of excitement of three new animals. No, just the one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whoops. <laughs> that one was just older and male and prepared by a different person. Yes, that just had a different tanning situation going on. Uh, meanwhile, there were still ongoing efforts just to capture one of these. The Belgian government tasked its military post in the Congo to prioritize the capture of an okapi. One of the first efforts did not go entirely according to plan. A Belgian lieutenant named Anzelius was able to get six skins, 
But he also shot an okapi instead of bringing it in alive. That made him the first European to kill one. By 1903, Belgian officials had captured a live okapi, but it escaped before they could arrange to transport it to Europe. In 1909, a group from the U.S. with funding from the American Museum of Natural History and the New York Zoological Society started a planned five-year expedition to collect specimens from the Congo and specifically from the Aturi Forest. On their very lengthy wish list was an Akapi. Per the rules regarding expeditions that the Belgian government had sent, again, Belgium was in control of the area, this team headed by mammalogist Herbert Lang, had to be escorted by Belgian soldiers. This group did find an indigenous tribe eating okapi, and from them, they learned that the animal was highly regarded and that there were a lot of rules and social customs regarding the animal's value and how one could and could not be killed in accordance with tradition, who was worthy in the social structure to even sit on a hide, and what powers one might gain according to their belief system while wearing the animal's skin. There is a lot of this story relayed through the accounts of the expedition and not the indigenous peoples about what they learned of the Bantu people they encountered there. They are specifically mentioned as Bantu. And keep in mind that the word Bantu is an umbrella term that was coined by William H. I. Bleak in the 1850s. It is not an identifier that anybody that white people would call Bantu would use, and there is no real cultural group that it refers to. So keep in mind, we are working with accounts that use an outdated and fallacious identifier for the people being described. So that puts the entire account in a bit of a precarious place in terms of accepting it at face value. So Lang's account indicates that he was able to gain the trust of the tribe by sending the Belgian soldiers away to their garrison and then negotiating so he could have their help in finding an Akapi. Lang was humble enough to recognize that he did not know what he was doing, writing that anyone from outside of the area who had seen or shot an Akapi had only been very lucky and not skilled. A member of the Azande people was able to capture an Okapi calf for Lang, but Lang did not successfully keep it alive. That challenge of keeping an Okapi in good health would plague numerous similar efforts. They just had very poor understanding of the animal's nutritional needs. Add to that the peril of shipping a live, wild animal, which involved traveling by truck and by boat, often with inexperienced people handling the animal or its crate at various points along the way, it becomes clear that only an extremely hardy animal could have survived all of this. When Lang's expedition returned to New York six and a half years after it left, the men brought back literally thousands of specimens of plants and animals, but no okapi. It actually took several more years for an okapi to make it to Europe alive. The first one was a calf named Buta, who was sent to the Antwerp Zoo after being hand-raised by the wife of the district commissioner of Bazuele, André Jacques Landigem. The animal only survived seven weeks after it got to Europe. Another okapi named Tele was shipped to the Antwerp Zoo nine years later in 1928. Tele lived in captivity for 15 years, and she might have lived longer, but she died of starvation in 1943 during World War II, when many European zoos were left damaged from bombing or poorly attended during Nazi occupation. Attempts to capture Okapi continued as other zoos tried to get their own animals, and people made so many mistakes. This really quickly evidences how having an animal was prioritized over the welfare of those animals. In 1928, Camp Putnam was established on the Ipulu River, and over time it became an Okapi capture station. By the late 1940s, the people who had taken over the management of Camp Putnam, which were Carl and Rosemary Ruff, had gained experience at capture and care, and over the next 40 years, they exported almost 70 okapi to zoos in Europe and North America. Survival rates remained really low, though. The animals often fell into ill health along the journey or shortly after they arrived at their destination. Parasitic infections in particular did a lot of damage to these very stressed animals. Yeah, basically, these were parasites that they had had 
most likely in their natural habitat, but because their immune system was so completely uh, debilitated by all of this stress and movement, they just couldn't fight them off the way they normally would have. North America's first copy arrived in 1937, and it became part of the animal collection at the Bronx Zoo. Over time, deforestation, mining, and the illegal hunting of okapi, because they are now protected by Congolese law, those have led to declining numbers in the wild. And the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, has declared the okapi an endangered species. The Institute in Congo for the Conservation of Nature and the IUCN SSC Giraffe Okapi Specialist Group work together to lead conservation efforts. In 1992, the Democratic Republic of Congo established the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. It is very difficult to get a count on Okapi in the wild because they are very shy and they are very good at avoiding people and their uh, natural camouflage works very well. The current estimates that we have are nearly a decade old because of that. But according to the Okapi Conservation Project, there are an estimated 3,000 to 3,500 Okapi on the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, and somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 total on Earth. In a twist, all those initially clumsy efforts to procure Okapi for zoos have actually led to the development of a significant avenue for conservation of the species. In 1977, Europe started the first captive breeding programs, and the Antwerp Zoo, the first to have received an Okapi from Africa, is now a leader in that effort. A lot of zoo programs also include in-situ support for conservation efforts in the wild. As of last year, there were almost 200 okapi in captivity, and captivity breeding programs have become an important part of the conservation effort, creating an assurance population. The goal is to reach 270 animals in such facilities to ensure a genetically healthy captive population. And since 2016, October 18th has been World Okapi Day, which is one when all of these conservation groups usually uh, share a lot of information and uh, try to help raise awareness and knowledge about them among the general population. Uh, For listener mail, I have a yummy one related to our recent Accidental Inventions episode. Uh, This is from our listener, Becca, who writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, hi, I'm Becca. I started listening to the podcast about a year ago, but have only started listening frequently during the spring break I am on right now. I was listening to the Accidental Inventions episode earlier today while on a walk, and I wanted to share some personal knowledge slash a story with you. You are right. Nuts are in the recipe on the back of chocolate morsel bags, although you can omit them, which I do which is the correct thing to do, in my opinion. Uh, (laughs) I made a little cheering gesture because I'm glad I remembered (laughs) rightly. I felt vindicated. Uh, I've become a bit of an expert on making these cookies as I bake them about six times within the first six months of quarantine back in 2020. I still make them frequently, as well as chocolate white chocolate chip cookies, both of which are big crowd pleasers with my family and my friends at school. I made cookies a lot when we had full day rehearsals for a play I was in, and the cast always got excited when I said I brought cookies to the lunch break. Your podcast is awesome, and I'm often up past midnight listening to it, and like I said, when I'm on walks. Y'all are awesome, and I'm definitely going to keep listening to the podcast. Hope y'all stay safe during these uncertain times. Becca, she also sent uh, a very beautiful picture of her cat, Angelo, who she has had almost her whole life, and he is a very mellow, cuddly cat. Um, So cute. So cute. Um, Listen, I'm a sucker for kitties. It's no secret, Mm -hmm. and this one looks very cuddly indeed and precious. Um, I, I also love that Becca mentioned that she makes cookies and brings them to her rehearsals. I am a big fan. I'm just going to put this out there in case anyone has ever wondered. Bringing baked goods where you go, particularly (laughs) for things that are like service situations, is the best way to win friends and influence people Mm -hmm. there is on the earth. I brought brownies to my dentist recently, and he was so thankful, and I feel like I get A-plus service. (laughs) I brought donuts to my tattoo artist recently. I didn't hand bake those, but um, listen, if you want to make somebody's day, bring something delicious wherever you go Mm. and everyone will want to be your pal. This is the secret I I give unto you. If you did not already know it, go forth. Um, Make more friends, get great service wherever you go. And also just because you want to take care of people. That's my usual impetus. It's like, I just want to make somebody's day easier or nicer. A delightful baked good will do it. 
hi ho, I'm on it. Um, <laughs> if you would like to write to us and share your baked good information or just whatever's going on that's pertinent or not to the podcast, you can do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also check out our social media, which is pretty much everywhere as Missed in History. And you can subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done that yet. That's easy as pie on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.